make us into a community. And uh, I love that. And I appreciate y'all inviting us into that tonight. Um, uh, we've, we've already sung our way a little bit into community. And I appreciate the uh, invitation to share a little bit about the community that I'm part of. I was, I was thinking about it uh, with the gospel text this week. You know, uh, when Lazarus gets called forth from the tomb, I don't know how things have been going here, but I've been uh, moving about in different corners of the church this year. And uh, I've, I've met a whole lot of people who feel like they need to be on a journey from death to life. I don't know, can, can I get an amen? Anybody feel like they're trying to journey from a lot of death, a lot of darkness into life and into the light. And uh, that beautiful story about Jesus calling, calling his friend Lazarus out of the grave is, uh, at least in part, uh, uh, a story uh, like uh, the one that William Stafford uh, uh, gives us in that in that uh, poem that uh, Nate read earlier. If you'll uh, if you'll imagine it from the other side, you know Jesus is calling him out, and you hear that voice of Jesus calling, and uh, Lazarus answers uh, in something that we're not used to seeing. But it takes not only Jesus, but also a whole community there around him to unwrap those grave clothes off and to, uh, and to invite uh, Lazarus from death into life. And in so many ways, I feel like that that is the journey of Lent. That is the journey toward God and toward community. Uh, one of the Desert Fathers said it like this. He said, he said, the world is like a great circle and God is at the center. And if from any point along the uh, edges of this circle where we live, if you move toward God, you'll move closer to your neighbor. Because uh, it's, it's, the, it's the sort of geometry of the creation that if we're, if, if we're moving closer to God, we're moving necessarily closer to others in community. Um, and that's kind of been my journey. I was, uh, I was raised in the Southern Baptist Church uh, where uh, they taught me to memorize the Bible in the King James Version. So it was good enough for Jesus, it was good enough for us. We to it. So I was uh, raised up on the Bible and, and uh, you know, really uh, captivated by the stories and by the message of it. But when I was growing up um, in the Southern Baptist Church, um, we had a pretty uh, narrow interpretation of what it meant to live that out in the world. And uh, it was more or less what Jerry Falwell told us it meant. Uh, we, we were kind of following that. Uh, but I had a, I had a kind of uh, conversion experience, really, that had to do with uh, meeting folks on the streets here in D.C. who invited me uh, uh, into a different imagination of what the gospel way looks like. And so um, I ended up following that way to Iraq in 2003, where my wife and I were part of a group called the Christian Peacemaker Team. So when the uh, Bush administration was in the White House here and uh, decided to have that whole shock and awe campaign against Baghdad, I was talking to some folks uh, on the way over who were familiar with that from their own life experience. I know many of you will remember it. Um, we were in Baghdad with this group that had gone to be with the people of Iraq while this was happening. It was a terrible time to be there. Uh, they bombed through the night uh, every night. Uh, and then daytimes were spent trying to pick up the pieces and sort things out and see who was hurt. So we would visit uh, homes and hospitals and places where uh, people who had been injured were being cared for. I'll never forget a, uh, a, a father of a kid who was in the bed there at the hospital pockmarked with this shrapnel that had come from a bomb that blew up the night before. Uh, this, this dad said to us, if this is democracy, we don't want it. If this is liberation, you can keep it. And, uh, and we were there uh, learning to say I'm sorry in Arabic and, and, and praying with, grieving with uh, folks who were going through hell. Uh, and at the same time, we were receiving their hospitality, which was a pretty incredible experience. We were driving through the, the western desert one day um, and in three cars, one of the cars in this caravan after two weeks of bombing hit a piece of shrapnel in the road and it blew the tire and the car careened to the ditch. Three guys split their heads open in the middle of this desert in the middle of the war. And uh, we didn't know exactly what we were going to do. Um, but this car of Iraqis showed up 
and uh, took them into their car, drove them to this town called Rutba, and the doctor there said, three days ago, your country bombed our hospital. He said, it's destroyed, we can't help you there. He said, but we will take care of you, because whether you're Christian or Muslim, Iraqi or American, we take care of everyone. And he sewed up their heads and, and saved their lives. We asked this doctor, you know, what we owed him for his services. Uh, that's sort of what you do here in America. And, uh, you know, you, you pay the doctor after he helps you. And he, uh, he scoffed at the suggestion. He cleared his throat, as they only can in the Middle East. He said, ah. He said, you Americans, you always want to pay for something. He said, no, please, just go and tell your people what's really happening here. And so uh, we came back to the, to the U.S. in that spring of 2003 when... You know, the, the, the images were coming back of the, you know, Iraqis cheering in the streets, and, and we hadn't seen any of those people, you know. I'm not sure where they came from. They, they were there on the camera. I saw them once I got back here, but I never saw them over there. At any rate, um, uh, we, we, we told that story over and over again, and the more I told the story, you know, as somebody raised on the Bible in the South, the more I realized that it was the Good Samaritan story, that the... The story that Jesus tells you know about the Samaritan who's supposed to be the enemy of the Jew and uh, stops by the roadside and, and picks him up and takes him to be cared for. It, it had happened to us, except it was a good Iraqi, it was a good Muslim who had shown us what God's love looks like. And at the end of that story, Jesus says, go and do likewise. So uh, we felt like having lived the story, Jesus was speaking to us. And uh, we were trying to figure out how to live out this love that we had been shown by uh, the, the doctor and the other people in Rutba. So we started a hospitality house in Durham, North Carolina, and named it the Rutba House after this little village in Iraq. And that's where I've been for these last 14 years or so um, uh, with uh, my wife Leah, uh, who was also part of that Christian Peacemaker team, and uh, lots of others who've come to join us, including three kids over the last 15 years. So, uh, so this this sort of journey toward community has been one that I feel like I was invited into uh, by uh, a good Iraqi and uh, or two or three and, and by Jesus and uh, it's a journey that is uh, uh, I think increasingly one where uh, I learn how much I need community. Um, shortly after we moved into the neighborhood uh, we met this guy named Sammy. My wife had uh, taken a position in the after school program that ran out of the school in the neighborhood. And uh, this is a historically black neighborhood that's right close to uh, Duke University and has a long history of being the kind of service neighborhood to the university. So uh, the first thing that people in town told us, you know, like to tell you if you go over to the southeast or whatever, is that, you, you know, somebody that looks like me is not supposed to be there. Uh, but the church had welcomed us in, and you know, other folks had started getting to know us, and so we were getting to know people. And and Leah was working this little after-school program, so she'd park the car and, and go in every day. And there was this group of guys that hung, guys that hung out on the corner there. And uh, one day, after she'd been doing this for several weeks, this guy uh, called out and said, "Why are you so stuck up?" And she turned around and said, "Well, what do you mean?" And he said, you park your car right there every day, go into that school, you never say anything to us. We're standing right here every day, why are you so stuck up? And she said, oh, I didn't know you wanted to talk. And she said, actually, I've got to run, you know, work with these kids right now, but uh, any of you want to, are welcome to join us for dinner at my house and we live over on Berkeley Street. So this guy, Sammy, shows up. And Sammy kept showing up. He showed up for dinner uh, two or three nights a week. Uh, he's been showing up ever since. So Sammy and I have been eating dinner together uh, uh, most nights for the last 14 years. And uh, early on in our conversation, the nice thing about dinner, the nice thing about eating is, you know, talking like we are right here. Uh, I guess you'll hear a lot from me, but I won't get to hear a lot from you. But at dinner, you know, you don't talk that way. You got to pass the bread and the knife and the butter, and, and uh, it's it's a it's, it's a nice exchange. And we got to know each other. Uh, and one of the things we learned early on is that we were almost exactly the same age. We had both been born uh, in 1980 in North Carolina, and uh, we had come up through the public schools. You know how when you meet somebody your age, you, you heard all the same songs on the radio at the same time growing up, and you know we went through the same kind of programs in school and saw the same cartoons when we were little. So we talked about all that stuff, you know, meal after meal. And I realized uh, that uh, Sammy and I have a whole lot in common, um, and 
uh, we had one incredibly uh, defining difference, uh, namely that I had grown up white in the tobacco country and he had grown up black in this neighborhood. And one of the things we realized that that meant was that uh, I didn't really have a personal relationship with anybody who'd spent any time in prison. And every man Sammy knew had some kind of experience with prisons. And I started doing a little bit of research and learning that uh, from the time we were born in 1980 until we met in the early 2000s, the prison population in our state had grown sevenfold. There were seven times as many people in prison then as there had been when we were born. And when we looked at it a little more closely, we realized that, you know, that wasn't a, uh, a, a uh, uh, what would you call that on a graph? It wasn't a J curve. It wasn't an exponential growth that came from an aggregate of the population. It came from specific places, places like Walltown, where we were, because of how the war on drugs was conducted through the 1980s and 90s neighborhoods like ours were targeted uh, for the enforcement of these tough on crime policies that put people behind bars for longer and longer. And so by the early 2000s when we came to the neighborhood, a neighborhood that has a rich history, a neighborhood where you know, people had stuck together through Jim Crow, had fought for civil rights together, you know, they had a church, they, um, they had this amazing, uh, we learned about this after we'd been there a while, and we were doing stuff with kids, and some of the old folks came around and said, you know, uh, people have been doing stuff with kids here for a long time. They, they said, do you ever hear about Mr. Alexander? And we said, no, it was Mr. Alexander. They said, well, uh, he worked in maintenance up at Duke, uh, but he had this little can that he would carry around to his, to his co-workers and to people up there and here in the neighborhood, and he collected enough money that he built the first youth center for African American youth in Durham, build it right there in our neighborhood, and he said, and they said, that, you know, he built a library there, and there was a softball field in the back, and, and it was a place for kids to come together, and so we learned that there was this this rich tradition of people, you know, caring for one another, and and uh, really, you know, self determination and, and loving the community, and that that had really been assaulted by a whole generation of uh, of families being torn apart by this uh, prison industrial complex. And so, and so uh, our hospitality, as a hospitality house, increasingly focused on uh, uh, welcoming people who were coming home from prison. Because after being locked up for years, often, uh, you know, they were in debt or they were uh, separated from family or family had moved. And a lot of people who were facing uh, homelessness were, were coming home from prison. And we we got to know folks who had lived that story, and we were sitting around the same dinner table sharing stories and, and realizing that you know people can have very different paths in their lives, and lots of different things happen to us. But uh, but at the core, you know, we're people, and God has stamped God's image on all of us, and we we really came to love one another. And and then about that time in North Carolina, we learned that uh, that our state was killing people uh, who were deemed irredeemable in that prison system. As a matter of fact, in the in the fall of 2005, they were killing someone about every other week. And, uh, and, and out of our table fellowship and out of the life that we were sharing there together, we really felt like that we couldn't just, uh, we couldn't just watch that happen. So we started going over and praying at the prison and keeping vigil with some folks who were there, uh, protesting the death penalty. And then uh, eventually, we, we really felt called to uh, get in the way and try to block the executions from happening. So we put on sackcloth and ashes. You know, we'd read that in the Bible somewhere that um, that in mourning people put on sackcloth and ashes. It is, it is Lent after all. Did any of y'all come up here and get a cross on your forehead? You know, from the ashes you came into the dust you will return. And uh, and that's the reality for all of us, which kind of suggests that uh, that it's a rather bold thing to say that we can take life from anyone else. And uh, our law recognizes that, of course, in prohibiting murder. Uh, and yet our, our state, have, some, some of our states have continued to sanction killing. Of course, some people say that we have to kill to show that killing is wrong. Uh, and, and, uh, and I know the just war tradition in which that has been justified, but even that doesn't make much sense anymore in this country because of the way that this, uh, this death penalty is really only ever brought to bear on poor and black bodies. And so we got to know those families, you know, families that were a lot like the families in our neighborhood and people who were losing uh, their brothers and sons. You know, one in 10 
folks on death row in the last 25 years have been exonerated of the crime for which they had been convicted. Now, you don't get exonerated in our courts without some sure enough hard evidence that you didn't do it. Um, so, I mean, can you imagine if one in 10 planes from BWI up here somewhere uh, was crashing? We'd shut the whole thing down. But, but, but we have this incredibly disparate system of, of, uh, of executions that in many ways ex extends the, uh, the, the lynching of the 20th century into the 21st century through a sort of uh, legal program that says that there are some people who are irredeemable, there are some people that we have to just get rid of. And at any rate, we felt called through our relationships with folks who have been in prison and with our neighbors into, into resisting that, which, uh, as you probably know, will uh, get you in jail yourself. Uh, and so this happened several times, and you know, they never know quite what to do when somebody like me comes to get arrested, you know, in all my clerical garb, and I got, I mean, I didn't wear it all night, but you know, I can dress up as much as your Episcopal priest. You know, Bap Baptists have got that stuff too. So, you know, we'd, we'd go into the prison all decked out in our collars and our, and our stoles, and uh, the cops would say, you know, what the hell do we have tonight? And, 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 and that happened several times, uh, and eventually uh, they got so fed up with us over there that they, they threw a bond on us. And, uh, and so we just had to stay in jail. What they used to call jail no bail, you know, in the movement. Uh, they sent us upstairs, processed us in, had to take all our clothes off, put on one of those jumpsuits, and, and we went upstairs. I walked onto the block, and it was packed. I mean, uh, our churches aren't packed out much these days, but our jails, our jails are packed. And, uh, and when I got on the block, uh, I immediately was approached by this young guy who looked at me and said, what the hell are you doing here? And uh, I guess his eye was trained about like the police downstairs. I mean, he, he, he knew I didn't quite fit, even though I wasn't in my robe anymore. And, uh, and I told him uh, how I ended up there. And he immediately started yelling to the whole block, which has acoustics, you know, kind of like this room, and big ceilings in there. And he's going, hey, hey! Gets everybody's attention and uh, explains the situation in some rather colorful language that I will repeat here in church. And, um, and invited us into a rap session where he uh, really taught me in about an hour and a half how the whole, uh, what they now call school to prison pipeline or neighborhood to prison pipeline, he explained how it all works. He said, you want to know how I knew you weren't supposed to be here? He said, because I knew everybody else in this room before we got here. He said, we're all from the same neighborhood. You know, that's how they do in our jails. They say it's gang prevention, but they put everybody from one neighborhood on one block and everybody from another neighborhood on another block to keep them from fighting each other, so they think. But this guy knew everybody on his block before they ever got to the county jail. And he knew I was an oddball showing up there because I didn't fit. Then he looked at me and he said, you were, you were out there trying to keep them from killing us. And I said, yeah. And he said, well, the train that ends at death row starts here. And he laid out how this, this war on drugs had targeted neighborhoods and how those neighborhoods were the places where people were brought into the system and how, how the system marked you with 250-some uh, collateral consequences so that even if you served your time and got out, you were still marked as a convicted felon and therefore you couldn't get a job, you couldn't get housing, you couldn't get you know, uh, uh, funding for education. Laid this whole thing out for me, and then we all got called and put on the chain and taken to the court and had a first appearance, and I got out because a lawyer there said, you can't hold people just because you're mad at them for doing something. you got to give them a day in court. So I was out of there, had my, had my education and was graduated just like that. But I got home and I started thinking about, wow, that was, I learned something there that I, I had never really learned in a lot of schooling. You know, I've done a lot of indoor schooling, but I never learned a lot of what they taught me there. And so uh, we started talking to the, the school in town, Duke University, about uh, maybe helping people get that kind of education on the inside of the prisons without getting a record. Because, you know, you, you can't, it, like I was saying, it can, it can cause some problems, you know, having this, this stuff on your record. So, uh, so it, it, it took us several years and, and lots of people worked on it. But, uh, but what that led to eventually was um, this thing called Project Turn that, that takes uh, students from the colleges and universities now inside of prisons to study alongside people who are there for semester long classes. And, and part, of, uh, part of why I was thinking about that tonight is because those little circles 
that are happening inside of prisons all over have kind of begun to feel like the dinner table at home to me. A space where people who, who wouldn't know each other otherwise are, are, get, are coming to know each other. Kind of like we got to know those uh, uh, Iraqi brothers and sisters on the roadside and in Rutba and, 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 and Sammy at the table and folks inside of prisons. But what I see in common across all of these is that this Jesus who promised to show up in the quote-unquote least of these, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. You remember the text, when I was in prison, you visited me. Jesus promised to show up in these places, and lo and behold, Jesus does. Not in some kind of gleaming white robe with a halo on, but, but in the community of people who come together and reveal to us something about who we really are. And, 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 and more and more, you know, in churches uh, like the ones where I grew up, you know, where we suffer from a lack of pigmentation, let me say, you know, uh, that, uh, that, that, that what I, part of what I realized about the gospel is that uh, the gospel in these places has been impoverished by whiteness. The gospel has been impoverished by whiteness and by the way that it has taught us to imagine ourselves as kind of individuals who have to figure out things for ourselves. And, uh, and, and, and even if it's a spiritual thing you've got to figure out, you know, you, you get to do it for yourself. And increasingly, I think the journey that I've been invited on, what I think really is a Lenten journey, a journey of penance that isn't about beating ourselves up, but is about laying some things down so we can rush on to something better, this journey has been about uh, coming into community and realizing that there are people who I might not in any other way be connected to, but because I become part of this thing called church, uh, you know, that's literally from the Greek, that means gathering, the called out, called out from all the systems of this world into this, into this new thing where we're sisters and brothers with people who we wouldn't be connected to otherwise, in this thing called church, it's the community that's saving us. And then I was reading one day in the second chapter of Ephesians, where whoever wrote Ephesians says to the Ephesians that Jesus himself is our peace because he has broken down the dividing wall of hostility and in his flesh Ephesians says in his flesh has made out of the two one and you know that's a beautiful text that often gets associated with reconciliation and with the work of bringing people together in the world but it had never occurred to me you know in all those years of memorizing it in the King James Version uh, it had never occurred to me what it says after that that out of the two he had made in his flesh one new humanity so that we could be reconciled to God. And all of a sudden, you know, it was like the scales falling from my eyes. I realized this is how God wants to save me. I thought I was saved when I walked down the aisle, you know, and pledged my life to Jesus at the Baptist church, which you got to do if you're in the Baptist church. There ain't any, there's no other way to get to it. I mean, y'all got baptism and confirmation and all that stuff, but you, there's no way to get there unless you walk the aisle. Right. I'll try to refrain from giving an altar call tonight. Um, <laughs> but that's, I, I, I thought that was it. I thought it was that moment. I thought I, it was one and done. But lo and behold, lo and behold, Ephesians says that we've been called onto this journey so that we can be brought together in the body of Christ with people who we would never have been with otherwise so that we could be reconciled to God. This is how God is saving us, my Lord. And so last night, we were circled up at the house. It's been a rough uh, spring at home, not just because all that's happening in the world, but also because our brother Antonio has uh, nearly died about three weeks ago. Uh, he has uh, what they now call Adult Respiratory Distress Syndrome. I'd never heard of it before, but uh, it turns out if it hits your lungs, it's really bad. Um, and uh, we thought he was almost gone over in the ICU at the hospital. But thanks to steroids and lots of good care, uh, Brother Antonio made it home. Now, when Brother Antonio came to us years ago, we actually got a call from the hospital 
asked us if we would host him for a while when he was coming out after another surgery because uh, because Antonio, who was in his 60s, um, had lived in the United States since he was 12 years old, had uh, worked in America's fields from California to Maine. Uh, uh, one of the great things about that dinner table experience with Brother Antonio is that uh, he's picked absolutely everything you can eat at a dinner. So he'll tell you where it comes from and you know how it's grown, and we've, we've had lots of education uh, about that. But at any rate, uh, uh, despite all of this work and the fact that this work had disabled him, uh, he doesn't qualify for disability in the United States because he's undocumented. Uh, so Brother Antonio is uh, in that category of people who, uh, uh, who uh, Mr. Trump says should be on the other side of the wall, whatever that means. But at any rate, uh, uh, here uh, he has become part of our community uh, ostensibly because uh, he has this need, because, you know, uh, we're a hospitality house and we ought to take him in. And, you know, lo lots of folks at the hospital and other places have been able to help him save his life. It's a great gift that he came home. But I was thinking about all this last night when we were sitting in our sharing group that we have where people check in. And Antonio let out and he was sharing about his experience and how, you know, this this being in a place of, of great need of almost dying had just reminded him how much he needs God. And his sharing, I noticed in that circle, of people who, you know, come from all kinds of places. We're black, we're white, we're brown. Some of us grew up with considerable means and went to fancy schools and all that. And some of us have come from poverty. It's a great mix, gay, straight, whatever. You know, we, we've got it all in our little circle. But there was something about the way Antonio led out with his sharing last night that seemed to break open everybody in the circle. We always go around and each person shares how they're doing. And one after another, I heard people talking about the real stuff in their lives. You know, the sort of stuff that you hope you might get up the courage to talk to your priest about one day. All of a sudden it was all flowing out, you know the mistakes that people have made, the abuses people have suffered over the years. And I thought, wow, what a gift. What a gift to be brought together in a community like this. What a gift to be led by people who we might thought were a guest at the door, but lo and behold, just like in Luke's Gospel, you know, when you invite them to come down and sit at the table, they take the seat at the head of the table and they break the bread and, and, and you find yourself saying, weren't our hearts burning within us while we were walking on the way? I think that is the journey toward community that we're invited to in Lent. And so my prayer for our Lenten journey is that on this way with Jesus toward the cross, that you might know Jesus, that we might all know Jesus in the surprising friendships that happen when we pay attention to uh, the most unlikely of, of, of folks who come along because we've, been, because we've become part of, uh, of this thing called church, this beloved community that God is getting together in the world. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 We ought to sing another song, don't you think? <laughs> Have y'all got another song? <laughs> all right, let's sing. <laughs>